Well then, I am here today uh, with an individual who has been contributing to some literature that I hadn't really considered very much until coming across your work in that sort of way, mainly because of my uh, demographic. But digging deeper, I found how important it is and how interesting it actually is uh, from a perspective of someone whose demographic it isn't specifically, which sounds like a strange way to get into it, but I want Lisa to introduce herself. So Lisa Baker, please, uh, how are you doing today? And tell us sort of I know what you do is quite an existential question uh, to start with, but however much or little uh, detail about yourself that you want to uh, divulge into, and we'll go from there. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for having me, first of all. Um, I am Lisa Baker. I just uh, about eight months ago retired from teaching for 15 years. I taught elementary music and junior high theater and culinary arts, which is an interesting combination in and of itself. And I was able to build that because it was at a small uh, Christian school. And uh, and then through that music teaching, um, kind of became an author. Uh, it wasn't something that I set out to do, although I do love writing. Uh, it was an English um, major, well, elementary education major with an emphasis in English. So I've always loved English. So that was uh, kind of the reason for having the ability, I guess, uh, to, to do this. And I, I just stumbled upon an idea for writing. I am now six books deep into having Amazing. written three published and have ideas for four more. I mean, at least at the very least, just it, it's been an interesting journey. Uh, and then speaking of journey, I have also been on the road for the I actually am and am considered homeless. I do not have an address. I don't have a home. We sold our home in California a couple of years ago. And for the last eight months have been traveling uh, internationally. So there is my story in a nutshell, the broad strokes anyway. Well, there's almost, you could almost do three individual podcasts just on your teaching career, your career as an author, <laughs> and also the travel all, all in one. So we'll I think of, you're right. <laughs> we'll dip our toes into each one and see where they sort of take us. So what, obviously one of the questions with, with this would be um, why, what made you want to write a kid's book, which I do want to hear, I've, I've heard, but I, I want my uh, listeners to hear as well. But going back uh, slightly further, with you getting into teaching, um, what was it about, like, have, have you always wanted to be a teacher? Is that sort of a career path you just kind of fell into? Like, what kind of started you on the journey of a, spe a career path that means you have to be very involved with children and like teaching them how to deal with life in a lot of ways? Like, how has that always been something you want to do? Or how did that journey sort of begin? That's an interesting question because I think I've always wanted to be an actor growing up. I think, and I, and I have gotten to do that community theater. So that's been fun. Um, by the way, teaching is acting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even for those introverted teachers, yep. teaching is acting. Film and if you're same. not, a, <laughs> yeah, if you're not a good, um, improv person, then, then te you should probably get out of teaching because, because a lot of teaching is trying to, um, if something doesn't work, you know, flipping it on the fly and then trying to uh, figure out. Uh, so I actually fell into my job. It was, it was really interesting. Um, I had kids young in my marriage and, I was fortunate for 10 years to be able to stay home with my two children. They, my children, children, the adults are now 22 and 26. So our children are. And when I had them in preschool, I loved that school so much. It was a Christian preschool and they didn't have an elementary school at that time. And the, the last year I was there with my youngest, I was just, I was really sad to leave, genuinely sad to leave. And two years later received an email from a friend and they said, Hey, the music teacher is leaving. Um, you should think about it. And I'm thinking, I, I don't have, I didn't get my degree. I started my degree in interior design, hmm. which is kind of weird, but still part of my passion and really aligns with theater and, set design. I mean, that whole thing just, it just married well together. But so I'm seeing this email and thinking, okay, sure. I've played music all my life. My parents met in the band. It, it, it's always, music has always been at my core, my foundation. Um, I've volunteered at church to teach. So really, I, I, I feel like it's always been in me. I just had to kind of, kind of, uh, 
stumble upon it. I think it had to be that way. I don't think it could ever have been that, okay, I'm going to become a teacher. I think it had to evolve that way. And so, and it did, I, I, messaged the uh the school and they said uh asked it oh and then this was this was literally three days before school was supposed to start that next year oh wow and i know it's crazy and so i'm like i just have this prompting okay uh message them and i i called them and they said they didn't they kind of settled on a teacher but she hadn't actually responded so she says come on in and i i'm like i'm in my workout clothes and i have my kids she goes come on in because they remembered me as a parent there Mm small school, you you really do get to know each other. And I walked out of there with a job, well, a job offer. And I said, I need to tell my husband, he doesn't even know I'm interviewing right now. <laughs> so I became a music teacher for preschool. We had about 350 students for preschool. So massive preschool. And then by that time, they had actually started an elementary school, kindergarten, first and second grade. And so I, I was teacher, music teacher for all. Well, that was 15 years ago and it became all the way up through sixth grade. And then for the last five years, we added a junior high, which added, it just opened up another element and level. Like I've always been a little bit scared of junior high students, but, but because of them being in a private school and having grown with us, we shaped them <laughs> into becoming absolutely delightful young adults. And um, it was just a great experience. So I, I was always, I was born to be a teacher. I feel like I I had the whole imposter syndrome at first, like, whoa, whoa so bad because, because I didn't, I didn't feel like I was right for the job. I mean, I didn't feel like, I, I totally felt like an imposter. I, I, that terminology wasn't around at the time. But it was it was very apparent. I really don't remember my first year, but I did go back to school, and in 2017 graduated uh, from Grand Canyon University all online, and so got my teaching credential, and so kind of did the whole thing backwards. But it um, and that really helped me become an even better teacher and better for junior high as well. And uh, that's it's just interesting. It seems like everything just kind of. I don't know, falls into my lap, maybe, which sounds really weird because it sounds like I'm not working for that or, but it's not true. It's, I just think that that's how my personality is. It's like, I have to be hit over the head with something in order to realize that's what I should be doing. So Mm. yeah, hit over the head about. (laughs) Yeah, that's a, that's a very, that's a very interesting story. And one thing about your sort of growing experience as a teacher, I'm thinking is that you got to learn with the kids you know as not only as they grew as individuals uh, and just generally throughout school but because your school hadn't branched into that those teaching those years yet you learned both with the students and as a teacher but also in the curriculum itself of, of exactly what you meant to be teaching them that must have been quite an interesting uh, transition that must really have helped you keep it like retain it even more so I absolutely agree with what you said as, as far as growing as a teacher, because I would, I would, I did not have curriculum. There's, there's, there are curriculum packages out there for, for music teachers, not like for the core classes. It's very, very different. Hmm. And I'm glad for that because I would experiment with the kids. If, and then I, and a lot of teaching music can be that project based learning, which is where you kind of have an end goal in your mind or, or you have like, okay, the theme, uh, I want to learn about the science of sound. Well, if someone, one of my students asks some, a question, and I had not thought of that before. I will take that and I'll go, okay, next week, I'm going to do some research on that. And let's do this project together. And, and so year after year, my curriculum would, or what I taught, would change a little bit, which is great because I have, that's the beauty of my job is I have those students, their entire school, school, uh, career because I have them at age five. I don't do preschool anymore, but I have them at age five all the way up to, to when they graduate. So I get to see them and and they are my children. I, my own children are confused when I talk sometimes because I'll say my kids, I don't, I don't say my students because they are my kids because, because of how this in the small, it's two around 200 children. And, uh, 
So I learn about them. Then I'm also able to learn how to teach them because I see how they learn. Um, I'll talk to their academic teachers. And, okay, okay. So and so has this thing that they're, I, I don't know, they're not quite getting because learning a, well, for example, learning recorder, the, the plastic. I remember that. We have that, yeah, the we have that over here. Like it's always okay. yeah. <laughs> so everybody gets to learn it around third, fourth grade, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, although our, we talked about that, our, our grade levels are a little bit different. But so I had a student that was dyslexic, and then also the next year he had handbells, which I absolutely loved getting to. Oh, let's talk about a learning experience there. I would we had a, a set of handbells, and these are thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, that it, it, the church had it and I was given the opportunity to teach it. And guess what? Never played them before. Never. So I had, I, I'm, I'm constantly learning. Did that with the ukulele. Got to learn the ukulele. So I'm one step ahead of the, the junior hires. And it, yes, it, it was a constant learning process, which was great because I love that. That is like, that feeds me is that constant learning. Um, I want to try something new. I'm, I'm not content to, sit for too long in one thing. Downside of that is I never get really good at one thing because I want to, I want to move on to to the next thing. (laughs) I think that's kind of been my life. It's like, I've never really been like a very good piano player because I can't devote enough time. I needed to move on to violin. I need to move on to cello, flute, French horn, all the percussion instruments. So that's, that's, yeah, that's kind of the, the story of the, the teaching thing, but it's, um, <laughs> I actually love it because that's, uh, that really feeds my soul, the, the way that whole thing works. And, and I really, really, really miss teaching. Talking about it so much recently, I, I will go back to teaching. I know that it's, it's just not an option to not, once we're done doing the, well, doing the long term traveling thing, we do more short term and get my job back or a job back. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 one of those because we're um we're Megan, she's a teacher as well, and we discussed mm-hmm. before recording. Um, she she really likes elements of teaching, but there's other parts where she really doesn't like, and she's sort of thinking over the next few years when we um eventually settle down fully and start um, having children and those sorts of things and go down that path, it'll be a career change, just like whether it be temporarily or not, just kind of try something different, go another path for a while. But she said like can always go back to it and it's always she heard from a lot of her sort of uh, older colleagues who'd been in the teaching industry for decades and decades rather than sort of five six years of being like yeah sometimes i i took a break when i had kids and then i came back part-time or i I came back in a different capacity and things and teaching is so valuable as a resource and with obviously you have uh, created we've released three children's books uh, but there are six kind of in the ether altogether at the moment and we're sure of many more to come so with your books then how do you think that your teaching has kind of helped you with writing those like how have you found because i I feel like a lot of what you've been saying with your the path that you kind of have in a way has been following it has been this there's been it sort of a clear indication in certain ways you can kind of maybe feel it um where you've just got this kind of core I'm going to go in this way. This this feels right. And obviously you doing teaching, linking in with writing children's books, one may not initially make that connection, but I'm sure that you've probably had time to think about it and that kind of idea. So I wonder if you could uh, explore that to uh, with us a little bit. So the path to writing a book, it, it was absolutely fascinating to me. Obviously I said I would never set out to do that. I was sitting in a... Uh, music class. It was, I had first graders. So they are seven, six, six turning seven, something like that. And I was doing instrument classification, which is teaching the children about instrument families. So they had already had a little bit of that in um, kindergarten, the learning the basic family. So this was a little bit of a re- review and then also digging a little deeper. So I asked them to name a string instrument and one little girl said, uh, raised her hand and, and said, carp. And I said, Summer, do you know what a carp is? Which 
I don't, I know I would not have known what that was as a first grader, but she knew. And she said, I'm sorry, Mrs. Baker. Oh, she said a carp, a carp is a fish. And I was really surprised. And then she said, I'm sorry, Mrs. Baker. I meant to say harp. And I said, Summer, that would be the silliest thing if a carp played a harp. I said, would it use its scales to play its scales? And, you know, plays on words like that. I'm always doing that with the kids because if I can get them to laugh, I mean, I think that's, I probably should be doing stand up comedy, although I don't know that I would be very good at it. <laughs> but it's my, <laughs> well, he laughed. So maybe I would be okay. I, I think that my goal is to have fun with the children and anytime I can get them to be silly and be imaginative. I, I've always been like that as a teacher. Um, and even if it's giving directions in rhymes, I've always been, Really, I was never the class clown growing up. I was extremely shy growing up, which is so weird. But that was also part of not finding myself or, or not understanding the gifts that I had, um, not having developed them yet. That came a lot later, actually. So, so I have, uh, this fun in class and, and then also the fact that I'm a music teacher and think in rhymes or, you know, lyrics or rhyme. So I think that that just kind of lent itself to me having an ability to be able to write, um, coupled with that huge imagination that I have. And then I just, I've read children's books because I had, you know, children, let's see, at the time that I was writing that, they, they, my kids were in high school. So I've gone through all reading all these books and some of them are some of them are absolutely wonderful and some of them are just okay. And I, that forced rhyme is, is always annoying where you, you're like, that really doesn't rhyme. You, you, mm. So I, when I set out to, to, to actually do this book, I'm like, okay, I think I can do this. I think I can do okay with this. And it was an absolute joy to do it. It gets, I don't know. It, it just was, it just opened up another, door, I guess. Another, another thing that I didn't know that I could do. And I'm mean, like, I hope I do it. Okay. I think I do. I think <laughs> I've received good reviews on my books. I'll say it that way. So and awards. And, oh, and awards. You're right. Thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, so, so then once that flood, that, that switch got flipped, that floodgate really was open and, and really writing three books that one summer. It's the three in the series. The first book is called, the very first book that I wrote is called In All of Your Days, Have You Seen the Ways an Animal Plays an Instrument? And let me tell you, that was really hard to come up with a title of that book. It was interesting. I was asking family members and, and I had, younger, the younger generation saying, oh, it should be, um, I don't know, some, they would throw something out. And then my musical cousins, they're, they're, and, and they're also educators as well. It was this, uh, it should be the animal kingdom or, so, you know, something like that. I was like, no, it has to say that it rhymes. You have to read the title and know it's a rhyming book because I don't, I don't, because I think it's a lot of fun as a parent. You'll see this if you if you choose to have kids, that it's actually a lot of fun to read these books sometimes, these rhyming books. And I, I've always enjoyed it. So I think the title had to reflect it. And then when I had the title, someone said something, oh, you should turn this into a series. So I was trying to think, okay, so do I take the, the, uh, the on the cover, there is a, a baboon playing a bassoon. Okay, do I take that? baboon and then make that a character in another book and and it just didn't feel right and then obviously I'm punny I well not obviously sometimes I'm punny and like to, and plays on words and so I'm like oh there that's what it should be it should be a play on a word but coming up with that title was was uh challenging now I I fully regret that super long title because <laughs> type it so many times and it's it's the longest title in the world and now there are going to be three of those so the second one uh was in all of your days or is going to be in all of your days have you seen the ways an animal plays a game and that one's fun because it's games that I would have played so my generation would have played um I'm not young I obviously have adult children so <laughs> I would have played as a kid and then also 
games that my parents would have played. And Tiddlywinks has been around a long time and that's in there. So that's maybe even three generations ago. So fun games like that, that'll, it'll cause fun conversations between person reading the book and person listening. And then my aunt said, you have to have three in a series. So I'm just like, okay, what, what, what's another play on the word play? And it became, in all of your days, have you seen the ways an animal plays pretend? Which, uh, don't tell book one, but that's my favorite. <laughs> my, it is going to be. So it is actually already uh, finished because I had the art done for it already because I knew that my uh, illustrator for books one and two chose not to do three. So I went ahead and grabbed an illustrator and the art is amazing. It's amazing. It's going to be, it's just a fabulous book. I, I love it because of the imagination part and kids. I think kids now have little opportunity for using their imagination. I have just seen phone after phone sitting in front of a kid in all of the places that I've traveled that little kids have had that phone put in front of them and it breaks my heart. Absolutely breaks my heart. I just hope that I'm just seeing just a small glimpse of it and that the rest of their lives they're using their imagination. But so this book hopefully will help uh, kids to be able to work on on that. Yeah, I mean, is although it does have a long name, it is memorable. And don't worry, friends, I'll put a link in the description so everyone can see that so you don't have to uh, remember that. But it, it's one of those where when you get a memorable book title, it does stick with people. And you want to tell people what it says, and your book title does do that. And the fact that you're doing a trilogy is is really it's great fun as well. It's it's just like, especially with you as a creative, you know, there was one moment where uh, the line I was thinking was like an avenue of creativity where it's, they, they are children's books, but you said before you have a, a, an enjoyment of uh, poetry and you, you like those kind of things. So it's like, this is a way for you to be being able to kind of creatively express yourself, but in a fun way, while also getting children either interested in uh, fun words and things or even the teachings that are in the books themselves either the stories or like in the uh, book you just named the instruments themselves and the different kind of groupings of all these instruments and kind of that can start to put the seeds that will flourish into a love of music or an intrigue into even just learning things like that thirst for knowledge is something that i think you don't i've thought before that if i you can't, i couldn't choose this but if i had a, a child and it would be in air quotes you know intelligent or not intelligent that kind of thing that would never bother me as long as i had a thirst for knowledge as long as i have one that wants to learn which i know is a lot of what one imparts on their own child so that is going to be up to myself um but it's like once the child wants to learn things everything around becomes a, a lot easier to do with in a lot of ways especially as an educator i'm sure that you've you've discovered that in your sort of one of the biggest things about school isn't necessarily the the teaching in itself it's it's having the, the student be receptive to what you're trying to let them know so i think books like this really help foster that from a young age absolutely yeah if you if you as a parent are always wondering about things like out loud wondering i wonder if and i know sometimes a lot of parents were like, oh my gosh, my child kept asking, keeps asking questions and, and it's just kind of getting to me. I think if you like, okay, take one of those questions and hey, let's explore that. If you, if you actually answer them by searching for, um, I don't know, making it a project, I guess, or making it a game or something like that, then you can, steer them toward that always wanting to learn. And if, yeah, you're right. If you yourself are being the one learning as well, um, doing it together, learning together, we've, we've done a lot of, well, I, I feel like we did a lot of that with our kids um, in trying to explore. We ex exposed them to, um, I don't, I, I don't want to say like adult things, but we did not talk at least for our first one, we did not talk the baby talk and, and, and he was, I don't know, maybe five, six supervised using power tools and because we would always work on our house, um, rebuilding things. And, and so we were always hands-on and physical and that he's, uh, our son right now is, is always learning. Uh, he's, we sat down recently and he's shared so much of his knowledge and, and it's just so impressive because he's always learning. 
our, our daughter's very creative. And so she's, she took that creative side and, and is exploring, um, uh, just a lot of that cr- creative world there with, uh, gosh, she's doing makeup design and set design. And, and, and that was kind of what, what she explored. Um, and now her, you know, her favorite is Dungeons and Dragons. D&D. Oh, very it's, nice. It's yeah. so fascinating. <laughs> I've, I've now kind of learned a little bit about that, a little bit about that world too. So it, it's been, uh, that's been a lot of fun to, to learn things through their eyes too, as adults, but yeah, always fostering my husband and I are, are doing our best, but as a teacher as well, um, and that's where that and we project based learning we that PBL that we teachers like to like to do and and more teachers should yes we have our set things that we need to do but but if you want to get a student to develop that thirst for learning uh it it really has to be continual it can't just be when they're really little and you have to continue doing that but uh, i think books do that i think books are, are helpful with, even if it's not something that you're wanting to teach them, but, but having them read a book, um, no matter what age they are, it, it gets them thinking about something other than the current thing or the games that they're playing or, or whatever it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I see what you're saying. And I want to link in with sort of with teaching of children where you did it for so long and now you've had the uh, books as well. What have you found your perception of how people learn has kind of changed over the years? So sort of when you started teaching, I wonder if did you think, oh, this is the best way to teach, doing it this way kind of thing. And then sort of compared to now or compared to even the end of your specific teaching career at the time, how has it kind of just changed in a sense of teaching? Because I'm always intrigued by when you're trying to pass your knowledge on to, you know, other people it's it's a very you have to really keep them obviously in gross and we already spoke about them having that thirst but i wonder if you could just tell us yeah how how did your teaching career change you as someone trying to teach not just not just the kids as well but other people in life just trying to you know convey knowledge and things that's a really interesting question because i think because my career path was very different from any other teacher that i've known because of getting the job and then receiving the education Mm -hmm. Um, I learned how to teach, uh, in America, we have the common core. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it's a style of teaching that really frustrates current parents because it's not how we learned as a child. Um, but what's very, very interesting about that, having learned how to teach that way. And when I did my, my, um, education, it was not as a music teacher, unfortunately, because you can't learn how to become a music teacher online. And I, because I was still working full time, raising the kids and, and, uh, helping them with their activities and things like that. So I had to do it all online. So I'm learning how to be a class, regular classroom teacher, which is, it, it's helpful, but it's just a little bit different anyway. So, so in the, in the style of teaching now is it's kind of this, parents see it as a completely backwards thing. What's really interesting is that's how I would have learned. I would have thrived in math if I learned that way. And I didn't, I did not thrive. I hated math, but I have absolutely loved um, learning how to teach it. So then I'm a better math student. And then I actually, two years ago, took on teaching uh, seven, uh, sixth grade math to challenge myself. We just need, had an opportunity. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to take the, the subject that I'm um, the weakest in and I'm going to be able to teach it because I just recently learned how to teach children that way. So the, um, so the teaching thing is constantly evolving. Teachers have to continually learn uh, because I don't know, it, it sounds funny, but styles of teaching keep changing. We're learning so much more how to teach to, to, uh, each learning style. Learning styles are, 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 they're all over the place. We need to use some students use your whole body. Some students need to just see things. Some students just need to hear things. So we try to, to teach that way. I was able, easily able to do that in, in music class because, music itself involves your whole body. Well, 
I mean, it should involve the whole body. <laughs> so, so that was an easier way to, to learn how to teach. But, but because I took my coursework, what, halfway, three quarters of the way through my teaching career? Yeah, about something like that. Um, although I had been taking classes prior to that, uh, to be able to teach preschool students, you have to have so many hours. So I was, I really was in school for just about that whole time that almost the 15 years I was teaching. Um, I mean, you, you, you kind of need to, as a teacher, you do need to continually learn. Your original question was, how has your teaching evolved? Is that what it is? More or less, I mean, you have somewhat answered that, but yeah, if you want to delve into that specific, uh, query as well. Yeah. How has your teaching kind of evolved over the years bouncing off that? But I think I, I, I think I may have touched on that is is yeah. just adapting to um, really you you kind of get your class and your group of students and you go okay what do we have here the nice thing is even though there are new students coming into the school every year um, at different grade levels I really have a handle on once I get them in their first year when I have them. Um, usually it's the, the kindergarten, the five year olds, then I, I kind of learn how they are yeah. <laughs> and, and are, am able to teach that way. But it's, um, you really do have to continually learn how to, to teach. Um, yeah, I think, I think I answered your question. Yeah, that, that is a good answer. And um, um, what's great about this sort of uh, conversation and some of the things that you've been up to is we can now somewhat flip it onto, it's like the other side of a coin. So what you've been speaking about is how you pass knowledge onto others and how you kind of deal with uh, humans in their formative years, you know, or at least one stage of their formative years. And recently, you know, you've gone traveling for, I think it's at eight months or so, and you've mm -hmm. been to, I've got, what, 14 different countries or so, plus a lot of USA travel as well. And uh, you've been around Europe and things, uh, and I've seen on your um, social media, there's lots of amazing videos uh, that your husband put together, and there's lots of cool photos that you've been putting online as well. So you've actually had the experience, you had that for the teaching experience for around 15 years, and then you know, you've been writing these books for a few years. I think 2019 was when you started writing. That's when the first one that you uh, mentioned came out and you've had three published since then. Uh, and then you've got uh, three more coming along at some point. And so recently, only in the last well, less than a year, you've then had to look outward in a very different way, as opposed to imparting knowledge on others. You've actually gone to so many different uh, countries and they have not been just stop off visits they've been proper for most of the countries i recall you saying you've been like several weeks in them um so i wonder if you could tell us i know uh, i've heard the reason why uh, and it's not what people may expect but it's still i think a very interesting story and then if you could just tell us a bit about your travels and how you've been enjoying them and things and how absorbing all that culture has been just for your your own person after so many years of doing such a severely different thing it's it's very intriguing <laughs> Definitely intriguing. Uh, okay, so my husband was supposed to be, uh, his corporate office was going to be moving to another state in the United States. And we had gone to visit um, several times and we're like, okay, I, I think we can do this. I, I kind of didn't want to because, I mean, I had in my mind my perfect job, music, theater, and culinary arts. Like that teaching cooking has just been the icing on the cake. Oh, that was funny. Um, <laughs> to be able to uh, have that, I don't know that I could find a job like that again. And I didn't I didn't necessarily want to leave. Our plan was we thought we were in our home, in our forever home. We 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 created the the most beautiful home that we could and we absolutely loved it. But then seeing this opportunity um, to move to another state, which in our opinion would have been a better uh, state to actually do the retirement years in because California is pretty expensive. So we were on board with that. We decided to sell our house um, at the peak of the, the real estate in anticipation of this move. Well, unfortunately, the company decided that they were going to move to a completely different state in another part of the U.S., the um, southeast part, something like that. And that is not where we wanted to live. And so uh, my husband was asking if he could work remotely, and that was not uh, an option with them, unfortunately. And so after 35 years with that company, he decided, okay, I'm really, it's retirement, like as far as 
time spent with a company, it was okay to retire. Now he's young to retire, but so, so we just, he decided to do that. And, and in seeing this, because he's going to retire and we were going to, I was going to, I actually had already quit my job, but I came on as a substitute teacher Mm. for that last year because we didn't know exactly when we were going to be doing that move. So that, and that was, wow, that was quite an experience too, getting to sub. I subbed in every single grade level. It was absolutely fascinating. I learned a lot just in that too. Okay. So then uh, we see this opportunity. We have like this gap of, gosh, we, we could, cause we, we were very surprised by the, uh, amount that our house sold. We didn't anticipate that when we had talked about it a couple of years before. It's like, Hey, great. You know what? I think that we should do this. I think, um, and we kept talking to people about it and fully expecting, cause we were saying, okay, we're going to travel for like a year or two, like, like abroad, not us, not get a, an RV and drive around. No, no, no. This is like travel abroad. And we fully expected everybody to say, you're crazy. Sell everything. We sold furniture. We sold, you know, put everything in the, the everything that we wanted to keep into a storage unit. We expected people to say no. We really did. We were like, okay. But when everybody said yes, we're like, I, I guess we're going to do this. I mean, we really were, were really surprised at how people thought, I think it's one of those things like, oh my gosh, I would do it if I could. Yeah. I'm not in a position, but you might as well. I could live vicariously through you, which, and, and that's been fun with the social media thing. A lot of friends have, have really enjoyed that. And so we just said, okay, we got to figure out like, w- what's the starting point? So, so that was a little overwhelming um, at first. So I didn't want to write down any countries because I didn't want it to, like, if it didn't work out, we, we just weren't sure. So I, uh, we attend a, a, a church, a non-denominational Christian church, and they were setting up a group trip to Israel in October. And so we jumped on with that. Then we planned backwards from there because we knew we were going to be leaving in uh, late August, early September. And so that's how we ended up going to, well, Canada. We did Canada first because only because there was a direct flight from Canada to Morocco. Oh, nice. So that was, so Morocco was our first country. We <laughs> like, wow, talk about culture shock. And, but because of being in the Middle East, we were with guides all through Israel. So Morocco, Egypt, Jordan, Israel. I think that's how it went. Something like that. So we're like 20 days in Morocco. And okay. So you had talked about uh, the, and now it, so I was imparting knowledge. Now I'm taking, I'm, I'm, I'm the student. Um, Mm -hmm. and I, I will tell you that my husband and I have learned more in the last eight months, learned more geography, learned more history, um, political history. We have learned more in the last eight months and have had such an appreciation for people and for, maybe how people are if they come across as rude or something like that, but, 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 you know, learning a little more of their story, like, like the people in, so we, we ended up in Albania for a month, an entire month. So that was the, the, mm, the practice. Cause the idea was to actually rent an Airbnb for a month. Cause you get a price break. Hmm. So one month in one country. So that was the, the first time. And that was Albania was December. Um, Turkey was the first time uh, of renting a car. So we rented a car, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, Turkey is incredible. I never would have gone, Oh yeah, let's vacation in Turkey. But I will tell you that really should be on your list. Turkey and Romania were my two surprise countries that I just would go back to in a heartbeat. The people were in incredible. Um, but so what I would, the, the part that I had started to say about it, uh, people that may come across as rude. So the Albanian country is very new. Um, and they just, they're, they kind of want to, get out. The young people kind of want to get out of Albania. There there just isn't this infrastructure that was built. It was just kind of a, an afterthought. The country was like, seemed like an afterthought. And so you could really feel the, the tension and, and, 
And so unfortunately, sometimes people can come across as rude and they're not, they're just, they're kind of stuck. They're, they, they want something better, but they're, they're not able to get it because maybe they can't get a visa to get out or, you know, and, and we came across that in, in a lot of countries, um, like the Moroccans want to leave. They, they, some people, not everybody, some people like it there, but, but so, so you, it, we really, really learned compassion. Um, and, and if you, if, if you don't travel to a, country with poverty, you really aren't going to understand what you have. I mean, I, I, I really, I've traveled. We've, my husband and I have made it a priority. We've been traveling our whole lives. My parents have been great to be able to watch the kids. Um, so lots of times we'll bring the kids with us, but, but in, in those, those moments where we're taking bigger trips and my husband and I celebrating an anniversary or something like that. So we, we've, we've traveled, but until you travel to a country that, that, um, there's, there's such poverty there. Um, you aren't going to realize the, the gifts that you have, the, and even coming from, cause we just came from, uh, Germany. Um, so we had a lot of European countries toward the end of our travels and, you know, I love it. I, I, if I could live, I think Spain and, Portugal may be my favorite. I don't know. I have so many. I can't even say. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. I can't even say that. But uh, so so even in those countries where there's um, wonderful grocery stores and, and amazing food and things like that, um, even though the grocery stores are small. So coming back here was a total culture shock. Coming back to the U.S. was a total culture shock. Even just, just the other way. It's like, oh my gosh, that's right. There's so, our grocery stores are huge. Our massive grocery stores. Just, I don't even know what else it, just the bigger, the bigger houses and kitchens and things like that. I don't know. We, we have it so good in America. We really do. And we just, I think so many people are like, oh, I can't, I I don't want to live here or or whatever it is. We are just so, we're so blessed here. We really are. And I've, I really didn't realize how much I took for granted living in the house that I (laughs) sold, um, (laughs) which, Hey, it's making another couple absolutely happy. And that makes me happy. So, but anyway, so it's, it has been a a, a huge learning experience um, of not just the places that we visited, but it's the, the cultures that we've learned about. And, And that's the beauty of how we've been traveling is yeah, weeks at a time in a city instead of, or, or even if it's a week in, in a city, it's, it's, it's been incredible, uh, to be able to really get to know the people. We've made so many friends. We, we really have. I, I, I really wish I could say that I'm going to come visit them again. I, I would love to. I am going back to Romania though. Uh, absolutely. Because I, I am writing a book right now, which is, this is another interesting thing about the writing process. Uh, and I know tangents are welcome here because here goes. So all of these books, the ideas uh, have been pretty solid in going into the book uh, with, with the other books. This book, I knew I wanted to write a book about... Um, okay, so the city is Sibiu, S-I-B-I-U, in Romania. And I think we were three quarters of the way. I don't remember like how long we had been in Romania, but long enough to, and it's a total, it's a medieval town full of, oh my gosh, full of such character. But the houses, some of the old houses, um, have these vents in their, their uh, sloped roofs that make it look like they have eyes. And I go, Mm -hmm. okay, I have to write a book about this. And so I actually looked online to see if there's anything like that. And there wasn't there. So I went to the local library. Thankfully, the young lady working in the children's section was able to uh, speak English enough that we, we, so I asked her, is there anything like that? And she goes, no, there's, there's nothing about for children about the eyes of, and it, there are things, there are maybe articles and things like that that make it a little bit scary. And I don't want it to be scary. I want it to be something fun and cute for kids. And I even, so we went to a coffee shop 
and I was talking to, oh, I think it was our last day there. And he was asking us how, spoke really good English. He was asking us how we uh, enjoyed the city. And I go, I love it so much. In fact, I want to write a book about it. And he's like, really? He has two young kids. So he's my target audience. He's my demographic that I would be selling to. And he goes, oh my gosh, please write a book. Our children's book books are like hundreds of years old. There's nothing new coming through. Talk about taking things for granted. Like we have English. I, I, I'm part of so many children's book or literature or author pages. Just daily, there's hundreds of books coming on the market. And for for a country to have nothing in or very few ch- good children's books in there. Um, but guess what? I'm stuck on my book right now. I, I'm, I, I don't know what it is. I can't figure out what has actually, I have experienced writer's block for the first time. Wow. It's so interesting. Um, I know the story, I know the story will come. Um, I think it's because of this transition of coming back to, to the U S. Um, I think it's a, it's thrown me a little bit. I need to, I need to relax a little, maybe find my quiet space because apparently I have to have quiet when I write. I don't know why it's really weird. Um, I'll, probably because there's always music in my head. I need to, mm. you know, try to get that out. But anyway, so, so I have experienced a little bit of, um, the story has not come easy to me. And I actually, actually think I know why. I just realized this. I, instead of the story coming to me, I'm coming to the story and it's, and I'm putting pressure on myself to do this because I, I actually have a translator too to, that's going to try. I'm like, I have this big grand plan for at least writing this book in, well, not in Romanian, English, and then translate it to Romanian and maybe even translate some of my other books into Romanian so that they can have some good children's literature. So I think that's what's going on is I, I, there's just this heavy weight, like, okay, you've got this big, big pressure to, to, to do this thing <laughs> well it's always like um there's with music is often like a second album syndrome or sometimes it's um you know where the first album is such a big hit and such a success mm-hmm. and sometimes my brother says like my dad was in bands my brother is in bands i love music i, I don't really play um but I, I love music as well as well as food and reading and travel so all good fun <laughs> there um different ways to, for which are good for the soul in a lot of ways but in completely varying aspects um but with with music and things it's kind of like the first album is the stuff you've been working on forever then the second album you've got bits and pieces from sort of the first album that's left over to kind of help you and then the third album my brother says is always the most difficult one because that's the one where it's kind of all fresh material and with yours it's almost like you had these kind of background ideas i think almost um static i mean um you've described yourself as a raging extrovert and i find and i i would probably identify as that as well myself but the I have a lot of thoughts all at once in your, in my head and it's kind of like static. I imagine with analog TVs when you'd go onto a channel and it wasn't tuned in right, that black and white, just sort of static. And I think that when focusing on traveling or food um, or music in a lot of ways, it kind of quietens that static and makes it more of a, a focus in, in a lot of ways. And I think that, yeah, when you've had these other three ideas that you've kind of had, these background noises kind of form into this kind of flow as you're now kind of trying to honing yourself while you're in an environmental shift as well i think that's quite a big thing you went from traveling a lot and it's with travel as much i love traveling and things and uh megan will attest to this as well it's amazing and you you don't have to worry about so many things like bills and all these kind of outside things it's all about kind of what you're doing then or what you're doing in the next few days or couple of weeks you don't have to worry about what you're doing in several months in the same way i know that you said your husband was when you're in hotel rooms each evening trying to plan the thing but it's a very different world and i think once you go back to across home or the country in which that you are uh you're normally in it, it just becomes it, it's a completely different way of living everything kind of stops around you in your immediate vicinity and everything on the outside is moving. Whereas in the when you're traveling, I think it's the inverse. The outside is all moving so quickly you don't really pay attention, but your your kind of immediate vicinity is constantly shifting, and there's kind of a comfort in that, I believe. I've just said a lot at you, so that wasn't really a question. I'm just kind of Oh, that was travel. so profound though. <laughs> that was absolutely 
spot on. It really was because there's, there's this, uh, okay. Am I really going to be seeking historical sites and, and things like that in the U S not as much. I mean, we have a lot to see because we're going to a couple of States um, coming up that we've never been to before. Um, and, and part of that is seeing family too. So that throws in a, a, a different aspect to it. But yeah, when you're traveling, when you're, even though we did build in days where we were um, just sitting in the Airbnb and working on, Whatever it was, we we did have down days. We weren't constantly traveling, but or, or sightseeing, I should say. But I think you're right. I think here the world is is kind of going on around, and and it feels. I actually was experiencing this today. Um, I'm very overwhelmed right now uh, emotionally because being back in the U.S. but not having okay, there we have destinations, but there is no home. There is, there's no, you know, when we go visit in California, there's no house that we're going to go to or, or apartment or whatever that, that, that we own anymore. And and so I think that that part of it, it, it just feels really strange. And until I have settled in and acknowledged that and, and I'm comfortable with that, I don't think I'm going to be able to produce um, some, some good ideas. But then again, in order to find peace and, and to feel happy, I need to be creative. So I'm kind of in this interesting little pattern that I, I may be stuck for a little while. We're actually go, going to um, the Smoky Mountains in, in Tennessee. And so this is more of a cabin type experience. And I'm hoping that this, um, yeah, just dial it back and, and stop consuming so much um, and, and to be able to just enjoy nature, which I absolutely love. And then, and I, and I'm sure it's going to come to me because I need to stop putting pressure on myself because even if this book gets d- completed in another month, that's totally fine. I mean, ri- it's ridiculous that I've been able to write books and okay. So I didn't talk about it on here, but that second book that was published. So it would be the fourth one written second book published was literally written on a plane ride. Let's see, it's a six-hour plane ride from Boston to California. I'm pretty sure it's about six hours. I watched a movie for an hour and a half, and then I wrote an entire children's book, which was shocking to me. Like, I absolutely cannot believe. It's because I really had the the, the scope of the story um, beach walking <laughs> and kind of planning it out in my head, but literally writing, like, who, who does? And a rhyming book. It's not just, <laughs> it's crazy. So... Because of those things, I have such high expectations of myself. Plus, I'm a perfectionist, and oh, excuse me, I'm a recovering perfectionist. <laughs> um, I have to put in that in in there because it, it's been destructive to my mental health to to have absolute perfection. I, I just have to. <laughs> I'm working on that. I, I'm a work in progress. Mm. It takes time. Uh, we're, we're, as a creative individual, there's always. I think one trap that's very easy for as a metaphor for certain people who may not be so uh, creatively inclined to understand is just what I have found with things is if you're making songs or you're drawing on a piece of canvas or something or painting and it's just like when you have to know when to kind of stop and take a step back and I think that can be a real problem with uh, creative sometimes is like when you're painting you think okay I'm finished oh no I just add another bit there oh then I add a bit there and you just can never stop you could just do it infinitely people do it with music where they just never release a song because they're always tweaking and it can happen with all works of uh, fiction any way one uh, sort of any avenue of creativity you can you as a creator kind of have to know a point where how much you want to put into this element or how little you want to put into that element and where to kind of stop and that also adds a layer of pressure to it as well so it is when you are a uh, quote solo artist like in a sense that you are i know that two of your books you've had illustrators assist you and with more to come you've got other illustrators as well but it's still that kind of you are the driving force behind these projects so there is that added pressure behind you but from what you said in this conversation like you know from your education from the travel and everything you are very good at adapting and at that, right now i just think yeah you're in a transitional phase and it just takes a little bit of time you know for uh you know from the car to press a moving car pressing the brake pedal to actually stopping those are actually three different um phases you know you're just in the braking phase at the moment it's just takes time to kind of 
process everything. And I think you probably talking about your works as you have been doing on this podcast and on other podcasts is probably helping unlock certain elements of either your own process or just, you know, when you have that positive affirmation kind of behind you when you're uh, putting yourself out there in a creative way, I really feel that it does motivate or it helps reignite the fire on certain more down days and things so you know everything that you've been doing is just fantastic for the the demographic that you've been aiming for and all the sort of work you've been doing and i think that you know your traveling as well has really helped or will help to feed into uh, your future works as well it's just um listening to your talk and the inspiration that you drive uh that you take not only but also that you're putting into the world is just amazing so i just thank you very much for all of this uh, information about the books and the travel and uh, as we start to wrap up here is there anything else you wanted to mention um before we start plugging all of your <laughs> how to uh, find all your stuff is there any sort of final statement or words you'd like to uh, say or share i think the the biggest thing is to to make sure that you're not staying stuck in your own bubble, like as a person, in order to grow in in any way at all. You need to get out of your own little bubble. And I know financially for a lot of people that's not possible, but I wonder if, I wonder if even going and, and serving somewhere, doing some type of, of charity can get yourself out of that little bubble. If you can't travel, then getting out of yourself, out of your little, instead of being the consumer all the, all the time to get out of yourself, do something for, for others. I think that is an absolutely huge thing. And I highly recommend doing something like that. Thank you so much for having me on this. <laughs> I really, really enjoyed this. I was, um, I don't know. I, I think I was getting really, really nervous about doing your podcast for for some reason, just maybe because it didn't have to do with authors. The other ones that I've done has focused on authors. And I think this was like, oh, gosh, you know, you, your audience is, is into Star Wars and, and, and just all of these different things that isn't children's literature. But I I have genuinely enjoyed this experience and I really appreciate you allowing me to be on here. So thank you so much. No worries at all. Yeah, it's one of those uh, weird things with this show is it makes it both impossibly difficult and very easy to, to market because there is no specific <laughs> niche. So it's just kind of like, who do I want to speak with? Who <laughs> who do I either want to see online or reach out to or come into contact with myself? Because people may not realize this. I don't say yes to everyone. If I did, I, I wouldn't be able to speak to all the other <laughs> incredible individuals I have my eyes set on. But it's just... Right. When certain people contact me, I I look into things of what they've been up to and I kind of get a vibe from there and then delve into sort of podcasts that they've done or other sort of pieces of content to get an idea of who they are. And I just found that your passion for this specifically really inspired me. And I'm glad that, you know, having, an, having a no niche audience like mine is an interesting part because a lot of my audience is to every episode and certain ones dip in and out and there's often newcomers and things. But I had an episode with an animator, um, Mandy Wong a while ago, and, um, she creates a, uh, animated kids show on YouTube. And, you know, lots of my listeners like uh, read comics or, uh, are air mm -hmm. quotes adults and things, but a lot of them either have kids or are going to be at some point or just have a vague interest in sort of the creative process. Because I find that my, my kind of uh, thing is I like seeing the passion behind people's eyes, you know, when they light up, when they get to talk about something that really means a lot to them. And I think whether or not you're creating, you know, adult, you know, content, or if you're creating, you know, a kid's thing, it's still that kind of idea of what your driving force is and what the creativity is and how you feel inspired. I think a lot of people, it's nice for them to hear those kind of things. And I just love that your positivity in everything that you do is very infectious. And I wanted to make sure I could share that with uh, the world and hearing really in depth, the, the things that kind of give an insight into what makes you, you and how you kind of see the world was just a really interesting thing to do. And I, I genuinely am inspired from hearing the things you've been up to and what you've got to come. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. That was so kind. Thank you. <laughs> well, please tell these wonderful uh, individuals. I'll put links in the description to uh, anything that you want to uh, put down there. But your website, that I know a lot of other podcast uh, hosts have had issues with trying to say, which I think is reading rhythms and rhymes, which I always find is interesting because rhythm and rhyme ironically don't rhyme, even though they're spelt very similarly. It's, you know, no, the I'm, a, I'm a big uh, alliterative person. In fact, the, the second Gertrude book, uh, which I, I don't think I actually said. So Gertrude mm. the Cow Gets in Trouble Somehow is my second published book. 
first in its series. The next book to come out is Gertrude the Cow Discovers Alliterations Now. I always <laughs> Amazing. adore alliterations. <laughs> Which is why I did the reading rhythms and rhymes. Uh, because of being a music teacher, I, I wanted that uh, music part in there. And then my books are probably always going to be rhyming books. I don't know. I don't know that I could ever write a non-rhyming book. Well, maybe. Well, I was going yes. to ask, uh, in brief, have you ever considered writing uh, the, um, like an age up from what you've been writing thus far? Like anything like that? I never would have considered it. But in... In learning more about publishing and learning from other authors, I think there's a possibility that I could do something like that. I think I would have to get back into teaching, maybe even teaching um, junior high again mm-hmm. or something like that to be around those kids to know what they or learn what they want to know. Um, I think if I if I were in touch with that demo, well, actually, one grade level up or young. YA books are, uh, young adult books are really actually geared more toward like the six, sixth grade for us, like 12, 13. So I really do, hmm, interesting. Have thought of it. I still don't know if I could do it. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's an idea just to throw it into the world and have it, have it just a little <laughs> seed in the back, just slowly growing. And then in a year's time, you'll be walking and the, the sun will be setting or you'll just find like a random leaf and you'll turn it over and then suddenly it all there come it flooding in. And then you'll be like, I'm really sorry. You have to just kind of make notes somewhere. Uh, yes. So I bid you the best uh, best vibes for all those kind of things. Whatever stuff you end up creating, if it is um, solely the content you'd be creating thus far for the demographic you have, it's still amazing. And it's still, you know, amazing to have someone who's so passionate about creating those things. But if you do branch out, it's it's a fun adventure. I'm sure you'll smash it like you have everything else that's come your way. So, you know, I mentioned your website, but please mention it again and any other uh, social media and give us all three of your books that are out one more time as well as we start to wrap this up. So the first book is In All of Your Days, Have You Seen the Ways an Animal Plays an Instrument? That is book one published. Book two published is Gertrude the Cow Gets in Trouble Somehow. And book three published that I also illustrated, don't get too excited, it's children's drawings. (laughs) That one is called Mom, What's That Sound? Uh, Because my disposal scared me one day. No, it wasn't that it scared me so much as I think that I, I was thinking my disposal or a disposal, which if you don't know. A disposal is what is attached to your sink that kind of chews up food. Not everybody has Garbage it, disposal. I think most of us in the UK know your, <laughs> okay. the way you guys do it as a garbage disposal. We don't use the word garbage. It's only for oh, your disposal. We thing. call it garbage disposal. What do you call it? Just we don't disposal. have it. We call it a garbage disposal. But we know oh, okay. because like over here, oh. garbage is rubbish. But we don't call it right. a rubbish disposal. Right. But we don't really oh, have okay. them. We just don't have them here. So we just know it is a garbage disposal, even though that- we don't use the word garbage. <laughs> So the, okay, that is interesting. You're right, because you use rubbish. So the garbage disposal is actually what prompted the idea for that book. Super silly. And what household um, items could sound like to a very, so that one's a very young audience, probably age two, two to about six, something like that. But yeah, I had fun with that one because I got to test it out on my students when I was, uh, doing my substitute teaching even down into the preschool level uh so that was fun okay so that one is mom what's that sound Mm -hmm. all three of those books are available on amazon and then my website one more time is reading rhythms and rhymes.com my instagram i have uh for that account is reading rhythms and rhymes or at reading rhythms and rhymes um i think i have a face yes i have a facebook page on that as well and then TikTok, same thing. Although I'm working on that, I know I need to get better about TikTok, but but we'll get there. This old lady will uh, figure it out soon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will. Well, it's been an absolute delight speaking with you. And uh, there are other avenues we could have gone down. You know, the amount of countries you went to, we could have a whole conversation about that traveling oh in goodness. itself <laughs> and more deep, um, deep diving into ideas such as, you know, imagination and things, because I think a lot of your bo- books specifically foster those ideas. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the, the door is open for you to come back on the show uh, whenever Thank you yeah. want. And if you've got other books coming out or if you do delve into, you know, any other <laughs> uh, ventures and you can let me know, uh, that would be amazing. But, it. yeah, just obviously I'll put details in the show notes to everything that you've mentioned and i'll write down all the book names as well um, just so people can see it clear as day uh, but just thank you once again for coming on the show i know my audience will appreciate it and it's just been a real delight speaking with you 
Thank you so much for having me.